you have a job that there are kids all over America that just dream of having. Is being an astronaut what you always wanted to do? Well, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a teacher. In fact, I did have an opportunity to teach when I was um, in college. I did some student teaching and some uh, assistant teaching. It, someday I'm going to go back to teaching again. And um, in fact, I, I had the opportunity to teach three years during my Air Force career at the Air Force Academy. And I find that the experiences that I have now is something that I can share and that I want to share in the classroom and, and maybe even on a, on a larger basis. But I think, you know, I have a lot of respect for teachers and, uh, and uh, that's something I wanted to do and something I'll do again someday. I've heard you say before that you fell in love with flying well before high school. Well, when I was a, a young child, I'm going back to maybe third or fourth grade, I, um, I started reading about flying, and the space program was really just uh, in its infancy back then, and I remember the Mercury and the Gemini program, and I was very interested in that. So I, I think through, uh, there wasn't much on television uh, back in those days about other than the news, so I, I uh, got most of my information through reading, and also through my, uh, through my hometown, um, in my experience at summer camp, um, I never had an opportunity to, to fly gliders myself, but we have a soaring field in Elmira, New York that uh, really inspired me when I was a young child um, that someday I was going to have an opportunity to do that. Tell me what you did in terms of your education and your career that has ultimately led you to, to the point eventually where you were qualified to become an astronaut. Well, I, I would start with the you know, I'm going to go all the way back to grammar school. I um, took math and science because it was required in grammar school, and I, I don't really remember having a particular uh, interest in that in grammar school over anything else uh, that I was taking, you know, whether it was English or social studies. I, I think I pretty much was equally interested, but it wasn't until high school I started realizing that, um, it, you know, I like math and I like science, and I, I wasn't the best in the class, and I didn't always get A's, but I, I liked what I did, um, in, in those subjects and when I graduated from high school I had to make a decision what am I going to do with my with my life and I knew I wanted to teach and I thought I'd go on and be a math teacher so I think there was a little bit of a of a uh, maybe a bug inside of me that that said you know math is your thing uh, my father wanted me to be an accountant uh, maybe he wanted me to do his income taxes for him I don't know but I uh, I went on uh, in math and science at a community college, and then my, uh, my last two years in college, I majored in math. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, specifically what type of career field I was going to go into. I just knew that I wanted to you know, pursue that interest. Now, I, I will say that I talk to young people nowadays that say, I just can't do math. It's too hard. And I, I don't accept that. I think math is hard for everybody. It, it's easier for some than others. But it's the kind of thing that if you work at it long enough, you're going to get it. And once you get it, you find that you have a love for it. And, and math is almost like music. There's like a natural thing to it. And, and uh, it, it's not really just a science. It's an art. So that's why I pursued math all the way up through uh, graduate school. You also had the opportunity to, uh, to use a, a career in the Air Force to, to help you do those things. Well, as a pilot in the Air Force, I used my background in math and, you know, science not as much of an extent, um, but the courses that I took in engineering definitely applied to my uh, flying. And I found that I was a better pilot because I had a, a solid technical background, although it's not necessarily required that you have a technical background to fly airplanes. I think it just makes it a little bit, a little bit easier, maybe a little bit more enjoyable um, as you go through the, the learning stage, as you go through pilot training. So that, that helped, and uh, I, I take the opportunity here to encourage young people, if you're not really sure what you want to do, um, I think that you, you really give yourself a lot more options if you stay in the, in the, keep a good, solid mathematical background in your academic environment, and you'll have more options available later in life, whether you decide to become a pilot or an engineer or, or, or teach. We have such a technical society nowadays that that math is really, is really essential. Who are your inspirations, your heroes growing up? Well, I'm, I'm often asked who my heroes are and, you know, is there, is there one person you'd like to name? 
And I never really like to name one person or even a few people because then I, I feel like I would be leaving out some, some very important influences in my life. But I can say in general, my parents uh, clearly have been a positive influence on me. And, and you know, p parents aren't perfect. My parents have never told me that, you know, the way they brought me up was, was absolutely perfect. Um, you know, parents make mistakes bringing up children. I'm a parent now. I know I make mistakes. But I think the key thing is that my parents always let me know that um, they loved me and whatever I wanted to do in my life, they would support that. And I'm, I'm the same way now with my children. So I think that that was a very important foundation that I had, and it gave me the confidence to go on and, and choose a rather unusual career because I knew that I was going to have the support of my parents, and I still do today. Um, other people that have uh, influenced me have been um, teachers, of course, um, throughout my you know, grammar, high school, and college. But in particular, I'd like to emphasize the bosses that I had in the Air Force. Uh, the Air Force was a wonderful place to work. I, I really lived in the Air Force. It was, it was uh, my life for the longest time. And I had bosses, my, my leaders, my supervisors or managers, whatever you want to say, would tell me, um, you know, what do you want to do in your next job? And I'd say, well, I think I'd like to be a test pilot. And they go, yeah, you can do that. And here's what you ought to do. And, well, I think I'd like to apply to the astronaut program. They say, you would make a good astronaut. What, you know, let's, let's, you know, get your career going in that direction. So I've had some great support uh, from the Air Force. And, and that's, you know, the, the military is a great place to be. You get a lot of responsibility and you get, you get a lot of support. And, and I liked the uh, fact that, you know, what I did in the Air Force was uh, I really felt like I was making an impact. Um, and the lastly, I'd like to say that, you know, the heroes were the astronauts that have gone before me and the test pilots and um, women pilots that, you know, flew back in World War II and the, the women that uh, went through the medical testing for the Mercury program. All of these people that I read about as I grew up through high school and college have influenced me in a positive way. I wanted to also ask you about other hobbies or interests in all the free time that you have uh, when you're not preparing to fly this mission? Well, astronauts have very little free time when they're training for a mission. Um, you know, I, when I get home from work, any, I make sure I study something every night. Um, you know, whether it's a shuttle-related systems type thing or if it's reading mail that applies to a procedure that will be affecting our mission or taking care of an issue to make sure that my crew is trained properly, um, I do. I do work when I get home, and I don't. Um, I don't advocate that. Um, I only do it to the to the point that I that I end up, you know, feeling uh, good about it that I've made a positive impact. Um, I like to spend time with my family, and uh, that's very important to me. And you know, I there's been a time in my life when I I did a lot of crazy things like riding motorcycles around uh, the state of Oklahoma. I think I. Um, I'm kind of an explorer at heart, and I like to travel. And uh, I've uh, flown airplanes uh, in the past, uh, non-NASA airplanes, again, traveling around the country, going to different air shows, and, and learning about uh, airplanes and the history of aviation. Those are kind of the things that I enjoy. And I've also um, had a, have a couple of telescopes that I enjoy looking at the night sky. Unfortunately, Houston's night sky isn't quite as clear as uh, Colorado's. In the years that I lived up there, I, I got to do some observing and, and really inspire an interest in astronomy. So, you know, I, I do have a lot of interest on the side. And one of the challenges of the astronaut program, especially when you're training for a mission, is to try to, you know, continue to enjoy the things that you like to do in life as you prepare for the mission. And in, in my case, and I think in all of for all of my crew, we have to cut back on our the things that we enjoy doing, at least for this period of our life, because training for this mission and being 100% prepared for everything we have to do is the most important thing to me right now. So, so that's where I'm concentrating all of my efforts. We always would assume that an astronaut understands the risks that are involved in the job they do, and I guess it's probably even clearer to us since the loss of Columbia and its crew. Tell me why you feel this job is worth that risk for you. Well, I, <clears throat> I'm a, 
I am a huge believer in human exploration and you go just think about the history of our country and the history of uh, the world really how I mean people have flourished around this planet because I think we have something inside of us humans have something inside of us uh, a need to explore and I think some people have it more than others you have the people that uh, you know 500 years ago got on these old ships and they sailed across the Atlantic Ocean or they sailed across the Pacific Ocean you know looking for something new looking for a better life you know looking for a better economy a way to make money whatever they were looking for they were explorers and we still have people today that like to do that and it's almost you know for me it's almost a need to explore I like to get out and do new things and see new things when it comes to flying in space we're taking very very small steps um, we're flying the space shuttle right now <coughs> we're building a space station we're going to go on from the space station to back to the moon and on to Mars to me this is very important for humans to get off the planet and go do these things so because I believe in this so much I think that yes there is risk in space travel but I think that it's safe enough that it's that I'm willing to take the risk um, I think it's much, much safer than what our ancestors did in traveling across the Atlantic Ocean in an old ship. I mean, I, frankly, I think they were crazy doing that, but, but they wanted to do that, and we need to carry on, we need to carry on the human exploration of the universe that we live in, and frankly, I'm honored to be part of that, and I'm proud to be part of it, and I want to be able to hand on, hand that, um, maybe a belief or enthusiasm that I have to the younger generation because I, I want us to continue to explore. How does your family deal with the <coughs> risks that are involved in your job? Well, my family very much supports what I'm doing. Uh, my parents have never once asked me to stop doing this job or not do this job. Um, they know how much I uh, believe in what I'm doing and I, I think they really support what I'm doing too. Um, they support the overall purpose of, of human exploration of space. And uh, now I'm married and I have two small children and they understand how much I love what I'm doing. You know, I come home and I talk about, you know, I ask them, what'd you do today? I tell them what I did. They've been out to, uh, to my job. They've seen the simulators. They've seen the T-38s. And it's exciting for them too. So I, the way I see it is we're all in this together. And I have great support from my family. It's been more than two years since Columbia and its crew were lost. Eileen, what was it like for you as an astronaut to deal with the reality of the fact that an accident had claimed the lives of seven of your friends? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, well, let me say, you know, I think, I think now the way I'd like to to deal with that question is um, I, I'd like to talk about the future and you know we will always remember Columbia and its crew and you know we we know that you know being an astronaut I mean frankly we we fly knowing that there's risk and the risk that's probably going to get us is something that's unknown and uh, you know we have flown a very safe uh, extremely safe space shuttle program since the Challenger accident. It was 17 years between Challenger and Columbia. And, uh, you know, the, the program I felt was just run very, very safely. And I have very high confidence in flying the shuttle orbiters and very high confidence in the people in the program. But, you know, there's, there's just risks in spaceflight and there's unknowns and we try to understand as much of it as we can. And, you know, the Columbia astronauts understood, you know, what the risks were. And, you know, I think we had gotten to a point where we were getting pretty confident because we had had, you know, 17 years and things were, I mean, we, we had a couple uh, times when we didn't fly because we had to go fix something and we'd fix it successfully and we'd get flying again. Um, you know, but we, it's, it's time to move on. You know, we will always remember our friends, but it's, it's time to, you know, take what they lived for and what they believed in 
space exploration and move on and get the shuttle flying again. And we need to get the space station built. And I know that's what they would want us to do. And that's not the end of it. You know, we're go from there we're going to go on to the moon and Mars. And you know, people have given their lives in throughout history in the name of making the Earth a better place to live for everybody. And I certainly consider this the, Co the Columbia and the Challenger, you know, in, in the, the whole history of the space program is part of moving on and making life better for people on Earth. And, you know, I want to carry on their work um, through the shuttle, the station, and the space exploration initiative. So, you know, I think that's the way I see it now, and that's the way I will continue to feel, you know, throughout this flight and, and even afterwards. Have you and your crewmates talked about ways that you can honor their memory and their spirit while you're flying your mission? Well, we're certainly going to do something on this mission to remember uh, Columbia and uh, its crew, you know, something from, you know, it, as simple as, you know, flying a, a photograph of the crew and displaying it where we can see it every day and we can remember them and uh, say a prayer for them every day in space. And uh, I certainly uh, will continue to remember them and, and between now and and when we actually uh, fly the mission, uh, we're going to have some things to, to remember them that I think will be special. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board pinpointed physical causes for the loss of Columbia and specified mechanical fixes to make flying the shuttle a safer thing to do. I'm going to ask you to, to briefly assess the improvements that have been made <coughs> in trying to eliminate debris and to detect okay. and repair damage that's been done by the shuttle. A and be brief at the same time. <laughs> okay, um, it just maybe uh, take this chronologically from, from the design of the external tank, which, which um, you know, we, we didn't redesign the entire tank, but the parts of the tank, that, of the foam on the ET that we knew could potentially fall off and become a debris hazard, those areas have been redesigned, and I have confidence in those redesigns. But just to make sure that we didn't miss anything, we have, we have uh, several things that we're going to do to check that. We have photography. Um, we have, uh, this is going to be the most photographed space shuttle mission that's ever launched, believe me. We're going to have cameras on the ground, on the external tank, on the shuttle, cameras on airplanes that are, that'll be flying during the ascent itself. I have no doubt we're going to have plenty of pictures of this launch. Um, the crew, our crew will be taking a picture of the external tank after it separates. On flight day two, we're going to be doing an exterior inspection um, with, with uh, cameras and lasers of the wing leading edge and the other side of the shuttle. On flight day three, we're going to do a picture on maneuver as we approach the space station so the station crew can look at us. I, I have no doubt that if there's any damage, we're going to know it. So I think that, that is kind of the, um, the uh, brunt of the Columbia recommendations. They also had a recommendation that if there is damage, we will be able to repair it. Um, we're not going to be able to repair every potential kind of damage that could happen to the exterior of the shuttle, but we're, we will have ways to repair some type of damage. And that's still being developed and will continue to be developed even after um, our flight discovery flies. Let me ask you more about that point. The, as you noted, repair procedures are still being developed, still being tested, certified. And yet the shuttle program's confident in going mm -hmm. ahead with this flight even as those those things are still being developed. You're comfortable with that approach? Um, I'm comfortable with where we are right now on uh, getting the shuttle ready to fly again. Um, everything is not going to be 100% 100 perfect when we fly Discovery. Um, first flight after the Columbia accident, everything's not going to be perfect. If we waited for everything to be perfect, we'd probably never get off the ground. But I'm confident enough that we have a good solid plan in place and the risks that are left out there are so minimal that I'm, having said that, I'm ready to fly with the plan that we have right now. Um, repairing the exterior of a shuttle is a, or a re-entry vehicle in general, is a very, very difficult thing to do. We have learned since the Columbia accident. In fact, we learned 20 years ago, uh, 20 plus years ago, when we originally tried to develop repair techniques um, back in the early days of the shuttle. Um, it, it's a very difficult uh, mechanical process, a chemical process in, in getting, getting a repair so it can 
uh, re-enter with these very, very tight uh, requirements to help the re-entry vehicle survive up to 3,000 degrees um, coming back to Earth. What we have to do, what we have done, is eliminate the source of the debris or the source of critical debris off the external tank. I believe we've done that. The next thing is to make sure that maybe, maybe if that didn't work, that we know it didn't work and we're doing that with the inspection. And then the, the third you know, layer of uh, redundancy or layer of protection, I guess you could say, would be the repair. You know, where, where's the damage? Uh, what time, of, what, uh, was it wing leading edge? Is it tile? Is it on the top of the wing, on the bottom of the wing? They could all use a, a different type of repair technique. So it's not just one type of repair we're trying to develop, but many different types. Very complicated process. Um, if you wait until you completely perfect every type of repair that you would need, is that the right thing we need to do? The way I see it is we're safe to fly. We can get this mission off successfully. We need to get back to the space station. We need to continue with the exploration. And myself and my crew are ready to fly um, with what we have today. But I believe we need to continue, even after Discovery flies, we need to continue to refine the repair techniques that we've worked on. And we need to continue looking in the research and development area for new ideas and new concepts. You're well aware that there are thousands of people all across the country who've been working for these past two years and will be working in the future on continuing to make improvements and, and develop these repair techniques. What are your thoughts about the contributions and the efforts that are <coughs> made by all these other people? But from where I sit, I am just so impressed of the work that's been done, and I'm so proud of the people across the country that have been supporting the return to flight effort, whether it's with the repair or the inspection, just getting the, the shuttle ready to fly again. It's been very difficult because as we have gone through this process and, and we've been learning, we'll say, hey, we need to go fix this now. And sometimes we had to actually take a little bit of a setback and go you know, work on a different direction, work on a different piece of hardware, whether it was dealing with the repair or just getting the shuttle ready to fly again. So there have been setbacks over the past two years. And the people that work in the shuttle program have taken on those challenges and they've gone and they've gotten it ready. And now's the time for them to see the, the fruits of their work is they see the shuttle, um, you know, people are starting to get excited now. We're getting close to launch and we're going to see this mission launch, fly successfully and land. And, you know, I don't know how I could possibly put it into words, my thanks to everybody who has worked so hard and not given up, not given up hope in the fact that, you know, space exploration is hard, but we're going to take that challenge and we're going to make it happen. And I just, I have uh, nothing but the utmost um, thanks and, and pride uh, for the people that have made it happen. What has it meant for you to get the opportunity to go to the NASA centers and meet those folks? Well, our crew has made an effort to get to get around to the you know the the people that support the main engine program, the boosters, obviously the external tank, the orbiter uh, project itself, and it's we have actually um, wanted to go meet these folks. So we've made calls and set up visits to the different factories. It's been hard because there's many places to visit, and we still have to train at the same time. But we've made it a priority, so it means very much to us and to our crew. Um, not only do we get to meet the people that work in our flight hardware, but we learn in that process also about the, um, I would say, the, the very um, detailed parts of the hardware that you normally wouldn't learn in your day-to-day -day training. You actually have to get out to the factories and see this happen. So it's been a real good experience for us, and it's something that I know we'll get a chance to, to do this again after the flight, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's good. It motivates us, too. Beyond the physical causes, CAIB cited organizational and human factors inside NASA that were also responsible for the loss of Columbia, management system, and the safety culture. Do you see changes that have been made for the better in those areas in the last two well, years? Well, you know, clearly there's been changes in our organization, our culture, the way we do things. Um, there's been some very specific changes that have been made and more subtle changes. But I want to say right up front that no organization is perfect. Um, I don't think NASA as an organization will ever be perfect. What makes us really good is that we recognize we're looking for where we can do better. You know, where are our faults? Where, 
where are we in a in a position where we got some problems let's identify them let's put something into place something that's that's really measurable that's really concrete if the organization is not working as well as it could in this area let's implement a change and not only do we do we search that out look for that and then and then implement something to help make it better um, with the inputs of the, of the folks that actually do the day-to-day -day work but it's out there for the whole country to listen to I mean for the past two years um, since the accident we've been reading about you know the NASA culture and I'm telling you that you know I have worked at other companies and you know every company every organization has these kinds of problems and I would challenge the rest of the world to take a look at what we're doing at NASA you know I'm proud of what we're doing we're taking steps to make our organization stronger and this really applies to you know to to any company even to even to schools and even to you know like family units people that work together on a day-to-day -day basis and it, it, you know it'll never be perfect because people aren't perfect but I'm still proud of the fact that we have taken these steps and, and we've gotten better. STS-114 is called LF-1. What does LF-1 mean? What are the goals of this well, flight? Well, the LF stands for logistics flight. Primarily, um, STS-114 is a resupply, resurfacing, repair of the International Space Station. But we also have a, an objective of the flight that's um, equally as important, and that's the test. I mean, you could call this a test in logistics flight because the testing that we're doing is for the um, recommendations that came about after the accident in the inspecting, inspecting the exterior of the orbiter and the external tank and uh, testing repair methods. So we really have, I see it as, as two major objectives on the flight. Now, the International Space Station has been kept supplied over the last two years using Russian launch vehicles, but they have comparatively small cargo capacities, Progress and Soyuz, uh, as compared to the space shuttle, and that's posed some challenges. Is reflying shuttles and the larger cargo capacity critical to the future of the station? Uh, yes, without a doubt. The, we, need the, we need the space shuttles to continue with the International Space Station. Um, if we want to if we want the International Space Station to do the original mission, which is uh, scientific research on orbit, we must have the shuttles to, to complete that objective. Well, let's talk about some of the, the big steps in the flight. In the very first few hours, you're going to be confirming some aspects of the redesign of the external tank. Tell me a little bit about what's involved in getting the data back to the ground from all the old and new cameras that you have, as well as a new set of sensors built into the wing leading edges. Okay. Right after main engine cutoff, on, right after the ascent, flight day one main engine cutoff, we're going to pitch the orbiter around, take photographs of the external tank before it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, we'll be taking, actually, uh, digital photographs as well as video. Both of those cameras have the ability to downlink that data. We will do that before we go to bed on flight day one. Um, we'll be sending it over a KU band communication system, and we have a, pr a procedure in place on orbit to make that happen. If for some reason we can't get it down on flight day one, we can get it down on flight day two. If we can't get it down via the shuttle system due to a malfunction, we can get it down through the space station. So we have a plan for that. We also have wing leading edge sensors. They're, they're like accelerometers that are planted under the both wing leading edges. If we get hit by something during the ascent, that would be detected by these accelerometers. But that data needs to be gathered by us as a crew on board into a digital file. We'll do that after main engine cutoff on flight day one. That file will also be downlinked to the ground on flight day one. They will be able to see peak data, you know, was, was there a hit on the wing? And, if, and they'll know where it was. So if they think, well, the left wing panel number 10 got, got hit in this location, we will go out on flight day two and we'll do a focused inspection. We're going to inspect that area anyway, but we'll do a focused inspection um, on any areas that, that were hit. Now, we don't expect to see any hits, but at least we'll have this. And the, the third big item would be the Flight Day 2 inspection, where we just do a general uh, inspection of the wing leading edges. That'll be with a uh, camera and two lasers on the end of a 50-foot boom extension on the shuttle arm. And all that data will be, it's going to be challenging to downlink that, but we'll get it all to the ground. If we don't get it all in flight day two, we, we hope to get it down by flight day four. Their pictures have been taken of the external tank after separation 
you know, on every mission up till now. What's different this time? Well, I, I think the difference now is the priority is higher. Um, we have uh, a specific need because we've done a redesign to the tank. We removed the bipod foam and we've replaced it with heaters. We still want to look at that area, um, the bipod area, and see how it made how it made it through the ascent. We specifically want to look at the flange area, which is separates the inner tank from the hydrogen tank. And, and we want to look at the sides of the tank. It, this is so important, it's such a high priority that the shuttle program is scheduling our launch for daytime. And they're in fact, the launch will be scheduled at a time such that we still have sunlight after we're in orbit and separate from the external tank. And, and that's how high priority it is. So, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I would just say that, you know, from the crew's point of view, we're training this uh, flight day one procedure over and over and over again. So so we can almost do it blindfolded. That's how high priority it is for me. You also referred to the inspections you do on flight day two. Tell me a little bit about the new orbiter boom sensor system and how it's designed to learn whether or not the shuttle has sustained any damage. The orbiter boom sensor system, the, well we call it the OBSS or d just the boom for short, is a, it, it's like a robot arm. It's 50 feet long but it is designed to be grappled by the, the shuttle robot arm and that'll give us approximately a hundred feet of, of extension that we can use to look in areas under the orbiter that we normally wouldn't be able to reach. On the end of the boom is a camera and two lasers and the, the two completely different lasers, they're redundant, they can both do the same job but they're different enough that for, for different conditions that we, we've got some redundancy there. We also have a, a, another small camera that we're using for clearance to make sure that that as we move this arm around, we don't accidentally hit the orbiter somewhere. Um, that data will be taken over all of flight day two. It's, it's go we're, we're not sure exactly how much time it's going to take. We'll learn that when we fly the mission. Remember, we're testing this. Um, this is a, a test flight, and what we learn hopefully will help uh, future inspections on, on future missions to get, it, to get it more efficient. The data will be downlinked. Um, one of the lasers will be video data. The other laser will be a data in a file, so there's uh, different ways to downlink this data. And uh, it, it's, it's going to be tough. Uh, this is not a, an easy job. It's going to be a long day. I think that we have a plan in place. Um, we have four crew members that are working on the inspection, and they're going to rotate in and out so the fatigue factor won't set in. And, and we're going to be making subjective comments uh, on the flight also to, again, to help as we, as we do this. We're like test pilots, and we're trying to look at a better way to make this happen, a more efficient and a, and a safer way. So it, it's, it'll be our entire, um, uh, I, I would say probably 80% of our duties on, on flight day two. Some of it will spill over into flight day four, most likely, but we'll be, we'll be ready for that. The inspections are going to continue into the final phases of your docking to the station as well. Talk about the plan to allow inspection of the upper and lower surfaces of Discovery as you get close to ISS. Well, as we uh, do the rendezvous on flight, about the middle of flight day three, we're coming in uh, from below the space station with the, um, with the uh, top of the orbiter approaching so we can see the space station out our overhead windows. Uh, 600 feet below the station, we'll start a pitch-around maneuver, and it goes very slow. It's less than one degree per second, and we'll expose the bottom of the orbiter to the crew on the space station. They have windows, with, they have uh, digital cameras with long lens so they can get very uh, focused uh, view of uh, both, the, both the upper side of the orbiter as well as the tiles underneath. They'll be taking pictures for, um, well, they have a very specific plan of certain areas that they are looking at. They have a mapping uh, uh, test plan, so to speak of what we want the pictures of. So they'll get those pictures and they'll downlink them um, as soon as possible after we do this uh, rendezvous pitch around maneuver. The ground should have them um, easily before the end of the day on flight day three. And then after we dock, we'll be going back out again with the, um, with the shuttle arm to take a look at, you know, maybe they found in, in the pitch around maneuver, they, they saw that there was a, a gouge in the tiles. We'll be able to go under with our lasers on flight day four or later and get a focused inspection on that area and then we'll know if it's, if it's something that would need to be repaired or not. I don't want to not pay attention to the fact that you're going to get to fly the great big shuttle and bump it up against the International Space Station in space. You looking forward to getting to, to do that flying? Well, just to back off, the rendezvous pitch around maneuver, I have a lot of confidence in, in the safety of doing that. In fact, the more I fly it, the easier it gets. Um, the, 
this will be my first time um, as an, just as an individual to actually fly the orbiter itself into dock with the space station. I've flown as a pilot before and I've supported um, dockings as I watched, uh, watched my commander fly it in and this will be my uh, first time to do it myself. But let me say that I consider the, uh, the rendezvous and the docking as a, as a is teamwork. It's a team task. I have uh, Jim Kelly is, is backing me up. He's my, my backup pilot and he's giving me range and range rate. He's watching the sensors. Um, he's available to, to operate the shuttle systems as we do the rendezvous. Um, Wendy Lawrence is flying the, is uh, shooting a handheld laser which also give me range and range rate and she's working the cameras. Charlie Camarda is also working cameras. He's, he's got the docking system. They're all talking to me. They're reading procedures to me. They're telling me uh, you know, range and range rate. So you know, I have a fantastic crew. The, it's, it's like music watching these guys as they, as they um, go through their, uh, their rendezvous training. Um, they're fantastic. And you know, they're you know, just a, a great resource. I mean, I, I don't think I could fly the rendezvous without these guys. So. You know, well, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing it. This will be your first time to fly a rendezvous. It'll be your second time to visit a space station. First time for this one. Have you given any thought to what you think it's going to be like to be there to open that hatch and have shuttle crews return to the space station? Well, I've put a lot of thought into, you know, what we're going to do, you know, opening the hatch, going on to the International Space Station, um, greeting our, our crew members. Uh, Expedition 11 will be uh, Sergei Krikalov and John Phillips. And I know they're going to be happy to see us because we're going to bring some surprises to them. And you know, in, in we'll do we'll have a welcome ceremony, and uh, it, it'll just be you know, we've trained for on the International Space Station um, mock-ups um, here at Johnson Space Center. And as I do that, I kind of imagine what it's going to look like. What are we going to do? Um, you know, how are we going to you know help out the mission, do the transfer? I, I'm very much looking forward to it. You know, I, I thought many many years ago. Um, I had flown three times in space. This is my fourth flight. Um, you know, did I want to fly a fourth flight? Yes, I definitely did because it was an opportunity for me to go somewhere I had never been, and that's the International Space Station. So now I have the opportunity to do that, and I'm just, I'm very much looking forward to it. As you've noted earlier, a big activity during the docked phase of the mission is going to be spacewalks. And part of your training in the past two years has focused on the EVA techniques for repairing possible damage to shuttle tiles. How involved have you and your crew been in the development of the techniques that, might, that you're going to test out? Well, our crew, it, it's been necessary for our EVA crew members, our spacewalk crew members, to be involved almost on a day-to-day -day basis with the development of repair techniques. And they have been doing that. They've been um, practicing with, with the tools and with the material that's going to be used and, you know, helped you know, work through the problems that we have, and it's been very important because um, when you get close to a shuttle launch, you just don't have a whole lot of extra time to go train things. These guys are trained, you know, for not for every single task, but for, for most of the tasks that have um, been developed over the past two years. They're at a point right now where they know most of what they're going to need to know to do the mission, and that really not only helps with our confidence level, but it helps us develop the right techniques. Let's talk about the, the, the spacewalk that is now referred to as a, as a test would be to, to test out some of these techniques that have been developed. In general terms, what is it that, that is planned to take place during that EVA? Well, you'll see we're taking up a, a, a tile repair board. It's going to sit in the aft um, port side, left side of the shuttle payload bay right next to our gyroscope. And it has a top on it. The crew members will go out and, and open up the tile repair board cover and they'll have tools that they'll set up around the station and they'll uh, practice some of the techniques that we have uh, put in place. Some of these are still to be determined and meet whatever test objectives have been laid out by the engineers. And those samples that get repaired or fixed or whatever will be brought back after the mission and tested in a facility here at Johnson Space Center to see, yes, how would they have survived a real entry samples that were actually repaired in space and that's a critical part of the certification process. There are additional spacewalks planned for your mission. Tell me about what the uh, the operations are in, in those on those days. Uh, another major EVA on the flight or another major spacewalk on the flight is the uh, control moment gyro. It's it's we call them CMGs. The gyroscope is a it, it's a huge 600 pound sphere that um, it 
will be will be changed out on board. It's it's actually a um, it's called the Z1 truss, which is a um, a truss segment just above the uh, U.S. node. Those four gyroscopes are used to control the attitude of the space station. One of them failed in the summer, and I think it was June of 2002, and we have this uh, critical need to repair this gyroscope because you need four of them when the space station is larger. You need four of these gyroscopes to help maintain the station attitude. So this is a very important uh, spacewalk for us. And I, I have a high amount of confidence. We've been training it for a long time, and we, we have good uh, flight-tested hardware that we're taking up to do the, this change out. It's going to take six and a half to seven hours to actually do the task. The other spacewalk on the flight is an external stowage platform. It's, it's basically a spare parts platform that we'll be attaching to the U.S. airlock, just to the forward part of the airlock. And on that platform, by the way, this is a 6,000-pound um, piece of metal that has uh, spare parts that are already mounted. We call them ORUs, or orbital replacement units. The spare parts that will be used in the future, if the primary component on the station fails, will have a spare part right there on orbit so the crew can go out and, and make the change. Future shuttle missions will take up more spare parts to put on the platform. So it's important, I think, for the long, uh, you know, for the life of the station, that we have this um, spare parts garage uh, available, and that's that's the primary purpose of that spacewalk. And we'll have we'll have time during that spacewalk to do some other things too. Mission concludes when you take the MPLM back into your payload bay. <laughs> You'll undock and come home. The last big event on the flight, the entry and the landing, is going to get more attention than probably any other entry and landing has maybe ever. What are your thoughts about that part of this flight? Well, it, just like any other segment of the flight, we're training for the deorbit prep, the deorbit burn, the entry, and the landing. And we, we break it up into different pieces and we train for that. Um, you know, I think back to my, my re-entries on my, my other flights, it, it is a very um, exciting part of the mission. If you can see the Earth below you, you're traveling at you know, Mach 25 over the surface of the Earth. Technically, you're still in space. And it's, it's just a, I mean, if you're coming in at night, you can see the orbiter glow around you. It's, it's really just a, a fantastic experience. I don't want to be distracted by that. We have a job on the orbit of you know, monitoring our um, entry attitude, our air speeds. The orbiter systems is is the you know the flight control system doing what it's supposed to do. So we actually have a job on orbit. So I try not to think about the distractions that are going on around me. I try to just focus on getting my job done. The entry goes very fast, as I just said. And next thing you know, you're flying the heading alignment cone at your you know Kennedy Space Center or Edwards, wherever your landing site is, and and it's like the time just speeds up. And next thing you know, you're landing. So I'm going to. Uh, as I did in my last flight, just revert back to my training, the shuttle training aircraft. I just pretend I'm flying a shuttle training aircraft. Um, such good training that it actually translates well to the actual orbiter. The difference being you're going from a zero-G environment on the real day to 1G, which feels a lot more like, like 1G the day you launched. <laughs> It's, um, it's quite a physiological change to your body when you come in and land. So we're, <clears throat> we're landing under those uh, stresses, but again, I've got you know, my crew making calls to me, and I've got the ground calling, you know, what are the winds? Um, we've had the support from the shuttle training aircraft. So you know, I feel like all this training that I've done is finally going to come together, and I'm going to focus on the landing. I'm, I try not to let the distractions come into play. And uh, it'll be very, very uh, procedure-oriented and, and very by the book. I've heard it said that STS-114 opens a new chapter in space exploration, the one that's going to transform a vision for space exploration into a reality. Do you agree? Well, as I see STS-114 as the next step in getting people off the planet and, you know, on, onto the moon and onto Mars, which is our nation's vision for space exploration right now. To do that, to, to get to the moon and to put a plan together to get onto Mars, we really need to complete the International Space Station to test what we're going to be doing when we're so far away from Earth that we may not have a way to get back quickly and safely. 
we've got to test as much as we can on the International Space Station to guarantee the safety and the success of the future missions. Now, to finish the International Space Station, we've got to get the shuttle flying again. And in 114 is the next step. Obviously, you know, we're going to get the logistics up to the space station. Our uh, purpose, I see more specifically, is to get the station from two crew members to three crew members. We get three crew members up there, we can do more science. We're doing minimal science on the station right now. We have so much potential to do more. We've, we've got to resupply the station with STS 114 and the 121, the missions to follow us, get back to three crew members on station, and, uh, and, and get back to doing more science. But keep in mind, we're, we're still learning on the space station now, even with two, two crew members. I believe we're learning a lot in just technical in-flight maintenance type of issues that are taking place right now. But I, I also believe we need to get the, we just need to get more science up there. So is your mission critical to the future of the station and therefore our future as explorers? Well, I, I would have to say that all the shuttle missions, you know, from now until we declare, you know, the station's complete and, you know, whatever date that happens to be, STS-114 is the first of those missions. It's going to be a visible mission. It's going to prove that, yes, we do have the shuttles flying again, but it's not the only mission. We can't do it with just one shuttle mission. We've got to fly the flight right after ours. It's going to be very similar to what we're doing, but they're going to take up the rest of the logistics that need to be there. The flight after that, STS-115, is taking up a, a, a truss segment, and, you know, we're going to have more truss segments. We have the uh, Node 2 that will be going up in, you know, a couple of years. All of these are very, very important. 114 is just one piece of the, of the series of shuttle flights that need to fly. We've got to prove that it's safe to get the shuttle flying again, and we have the confidence to do that.